Hey everybody, and welcome back to Ready Steady Play. And if you know anything from the thumbnail and video title, you'll know this is a setup and rules video for Edge of Darkness, which is the card crafting magnum opus from John D. Clare. John originally conceived of the card crafting system with Mystic Veil vale many years ago. And we talked about Edge of Darkness at that time. And finally it is here and ready to be played. So in this video I will teach you how to set up and play the game so that you can get started with your own set at home. What I've got here is the Kickstarter version, but you might have the retail version and that's okay because we're just going to look at content from the retail version today because that's all you need to get started with learning. But uh, I will show you the Kickstarter components in the components section of this video so you know what they are and what they're for. They don't change the fundamental mechanisms of the game so we can still learn how the game plays without looking at that extra Kickstarter stuff. Edge of Darkness is a competitive card crafting game. It's a little peculiar. It's card drafting. It's action selection, but you're drafting from a communal deck that everybody's building. It's for one to four players. There's a solo mode, and it probably takes it probably takes about an hour to play, depending on your player count. The game is pretty middleweight. There is some options to change the heaviness of the game by altering the kingdom. There is a sort of a kingdom of cards that you'll be using to craft your cards a la Dominion or original Machikaro style. So without further ado, let's get stuck into the components for Edge of Darkness. This will be pretty quick. Then we'll go into setup and finally gameplay. All of the sections are of course listed in the description below as usual. In the box you're going to find three boards. You've got two expansion boards which you can use if you have the luxury of table space, but if not then you don't need to use these. They're just there to add grandeur. And they fit onto the main game board which you will need to use like this. So you also have a rule book and a player's handbook. The player's handbook contains all of the scenarios that you might want to play, all of the suggested layouts such as this one. And it also contains rules for all of the buildings present here, as well as all of the cards. So this will be vital to learning how to play with all of these different game variants. You should have money in denominations of 1, 4, and 10. You've got these goodwill influence tokens. This is a goodwill, and that's, oop, that's an influence. They come in denominations of 1, 4, and 20. And you should have these reputation tokens as well. These are victory points, and they come in 1, 4s, and 10s. And if you have the Kickstarter version of the game, you will have all of these in plastic. You might also have metal coins, but I don't have those. You should have a number of building tiles that look like this. Each building has a number on the top that is associated with a deck of advancement cards, which look like this. These are the ones for Capitol Hall, and there should be six of these per building. You can match them by the number here. And they may be middle cards like this, bottom cards, and some even have a top slot as well. You'll also have a set of civilians that look like this. And this is the, if this is your first time playing, you'll have to sleeve them in the card sleeves that come with the game, which look like that. You probably have some sets of card sleeves like this. They're pretty good. They give you some extras just in case you tear some because you need these to play. So we've got some citizens, and you should have eight normal citizens. You should also have four normal patricians. All of the cards also have a blight side with monsters on the back, just to avoid any confusion there. You'll notice that three of the citizens and two of the patricians are distinct because on their blight side, they've got these little four plus and three plus notations up on the top banner. And these are just added if your player count is over two. We've got a starting player marker here. And we've got a round marker here. And we've also got their Kickstarter plastic model equivalents. 
we've got a set of 15 generic black cubes, um, which may not, which may be wooden in the uh, retail version. You've got cards like this, which match the building tiles. These are randomizer cards if you want to randomize your city layout. And you'll have a number of these based on which version of the game you have. Before we move on, I'm going to show you the Blight Tower and its tower top. We'll be putting cubes in here to determine their future. We've got two super handy player aids that are double-sided. There are four guilds in the game that players can play as. Each guild has an identical setup. So let's look at one set of guild pieces now. This is the Cabal of Shadows. Each guild comes with four starting guild cards. So you've got three citizens and one uh, patrician. They all have some names and sort of flavor for your guild on them. And those will need to be sleeved just like the citizen and patrician cards we looked at earlier. Those are now the only cards you have to sleeve in the whole game. The four guild cards for each of the four guilds and the citizen and patrician cards and that's it. We've also got these unsleeved allegiance banners as well, and there should be seven of those for each guild. You'll have ten agent tokens with a untrained and trained side. You'll have twelve numbered player markers. You've got a little tower like this. And fifteen cubes like this. And if you don't have the Kickstarter version, again, these might be wooden. And if you have the Kickstarter version, you have plastic equivalents of all of these things. Finally, you will have three Edge of Darkness buckets like this one. And these can be used to hold your acrylic tokens. Last but not least, you've got this bag to hold all your cubes in. And this Edge of Darkness score pad for endgame scoring. So as I'm sure you can imagine, there are a lot more of those city tiles and those advancement cards you know depending on whether you have the retail or the kickstarter if you've got the kickstarter you'll have a lot more and if you've got the retail you'll still have more as well so what i'm going to do rather than go through them all is i'm going to show you how to set up a basic game so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be setting up the basic scenario there is a book with a number of scenarios again based on which version of the game you have, it will give you a number of scenarios. But we're just going to look at the basic one because that introduces you to all the rules and will teach you how the game functions at a fundamental level. Everything after that just messes with the rules and adds more complexity and allows players to interact with one another in more combative ways. I'll be setting up a three-player game, but where there are differences with the two-player and three-player version, I'll just mention them. Specifically, it's to do with uh, a very minor details in the setup and some very minor details during the first round of play called the prologue. But without further ado, let's get into setting up the game. And the very first thing you're going to want to do is set up the board because there are two ways to do this. So you will need the main game board. And if you have ample table space, you can put out these game board extensions as well. What we're going to be doing once we've set this up is we've got our buildings to put out that are present in Aegis, the city here. An example of which is we is the Capitol Hall that we looked up in the component section. Now, if you're setting up with the expansion boards because you've got room, you can put the building under any of the slots around the outside board, and then you just put the associated advancement cards into this position here. And you will do this for all 10 slots around the outside of the board because every game is played with 10 buildings. However, if you don't have space for that, the more compact setup removes the expansion boards and has you place the buildings directly next to the main game board with the advancements on the building themselves. Now the reason for this is because later players will be putting player pieces on the buildings and those spaces themselves and using the board expansions just means that you won't obscure the plastic advancements with your player pieces. So now we've got our 10 buildings set up. These are the 10 buildings recommended by the starter game from the rulebook. So you put out your reputation markers in the shield slot bot here. You put out the money in the money slot here. 
And finally, the goodwill influence tokens into the final slot here. We can take our wizardly round marker and put it onto the prologue space up here. And then we'll take the eight citizens, four patricians, plus any of the additional patricians and citizens that we need to add for player count. So in this case, we're going to add one additional patrician and two additional citizens for our three-player game, leaving one patrician and one citizen in the box. You can form a deck with these and leave them here in the discard pile. No need to shuffle for now. Next, we'll put out the Threat Tower. Then we're going to deal three cards from the Citizen and Patrician deck onto the Threat Tower. If you remember correctly, all of these cards have a Blight side with an evil villain on it. Now, the rulebook says to take these cards and put them into their slots on the tower here. And then you'll be able to see them, and so will all the players. But because I am filming and there is an issue with the lights, I will lay them down in front of the tower for the purposes of this video. You can turn the remainder of your citizen and patrician cards to the discard pile. And now we're going to set up a player board. Keep your four guild cards somewhere close by. You'll need them in a moment. Keep your seven allegiance cards somewhere close by as well. You'll take four trained agents and put them into the trained agent slot on your player board. The remaining six agents will remain untrained somewhere nearby. You'll have to train them during the game. Take your little tower defense marker here and put it on the top track of this tower defense track along the right side of your board. Keep your player markers somewhere close at hand as well. You'll need those for later. We're going to take our cubes and we're going to add them to a pool with everyone else's. So, as you can see, I've set out three player boards. We've got the Feed Cartel, the Carnival of Shadows, and the Gilded Leaves. And we're almost ready to start the prologue, but before we do that, we've just got to create the bag of threat tokens. So as you can see here, we've got 45 tokens for the three player colors that are playing in our game. We haven't got the fourth color because that player is not playing. And then we're just gonna add the 15 black tokens as well. And then we're gonna take all 60 tokens and put them in this bag. Now that we've built our threat bag, we can just finish the last part of setup. We're gonna go into the bag and draw two random squares to put into the threat zone on each player's board. And it doesn't matter which color these are. I mean, it does, but there's no specific color that you need to draw. You're just having two on your board. In addition, we're gonna take four and launch them directly into the tower. The idea is to randomize them between these trays, so don't try to throw them in to achieve a specific tray. Don't forget to give out some of those player aids if you want to. And the very last thing to do is pick a starting player. I'm gonna make it the Feed Cartel. It says in the rules just to choose randomly. So now we are ready to start playing the game properly. So you've set up Edge of Darkness, you're ready to start playing, and you probably find yourself wondering, what is this game and how do I win it? Well, this is the city of Aegis, and Aegis has 10 important buildings in it, which we've laid out around the outside of the main board here. And these 10 buildings will vary depending on the game setup that you're using. You can randomize them, or you can select one of the suggested setups from the player handbook that increase in complexity. The number available to you will depend on what version of the game that you have. Once these buildings are out, the objective of the game is to take control of the city. And you are one of these guilds vying for power. And Aegis is on the brink of the edge of darkness. So there is Blight, which is the dark corrupting power of the darkness creeping into the city and turning the good citizens into these evil threats. And this deck represents all of the citizens available in the city. And we're going to add some of our guild people to it as well during the prologue. And we're going to create one huge communal deck that everyone's going to play from, drafting cards and then making an action selection based on the cards that they've drafted. And we'll do eight rounds of drafting and playing actions. And after the end of the eighth round, we will tally up victory points to see who is the winner. And you will score victory points for the number of your allegiance slips that appear in this deck of cards. 
You'll score victory points for all of the reputation that you've acquired, which can largely be acquired through killing monsters, but can also be acquired from some buildings in the city as well. You will also score points for having more agents. Every agent that you have at the end of the game will earn you one point. In addition to that, you will also earn points for money and for goodwill as well, although you'll earn far fewer points for that. You will also earn points for the position of your defense tower on your defense track. Every time you are hit by one of these threats, this defense track will drop, so you want to avoid being attacked and keeping your tower at the top of the track where it begins. Finally, whoever has the lead in any of these categories at the end of the game will also get a small bonus for leading the way in that category. So, with that in mind, let's have a look at just how we're going to actually get there. The game begins with a prologue, and then eight identical rounds, which will of course increase in complexity as we put these advancements into these cards. The prologue consists of doing exactly that, so let's have a look at how the prologue works. So the prologue begins in a three-player game with the first player choosing one of these advancements to slot into their four guild cards. So, you'll notice that we've got our starting deck here sleeved, and we've got four cards associated with each guild that have also been sleeved. These are the only cards that you need to sleeve in the game. Everything else is slotted into these cards and occupies spaces within the cards. And you can see that each card has three spaces in it. Cards with the guild symbol on them are neutral to that guild, and they can never change their allegiance. Guilds will claim neutral cards over the course of the game in order to score points at the end, and also because any other guild that wants to play their cards will have to pay them a fee. Even if you have a guild allegiance, you still count as having three slots, and ideally what you really want is to fill up your allied cards with slots, because for each slot on the card that's filled at the end of the game, you'll gain a point, including whoever's at the top. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take turns drafting these advancements into our guild cards so we start with some advancements at the beginning of the game. Any advancements that aren't drafted by the players are going to go into this neutral deck so that one of everything is present at the start, and furthermore this kind of gets the ball running on the whole card crafting element. But we can't really choose any of these advancements or really perform the prologue until we understand exactly what's going on. So now I'm going to run you down just what all of this means. And this might seem overwhelming, but don't worry because we've got the simplest version of this stuff out here. And furthermore, this actually represents pretty much all of the mechanisms that are present in the game. Any additional mechanisms are sort of introduced with a building in particular. So once you understand the card crafting system, and basically the monster fighting system, you've pretty much got all you need to know. The rest is just resource management and action selection. Before we get st stuck into all the buildings, let's look at our two generic friends here. The citizen just gives you a battle point, and that will make more sense once we finish going through the buildings. The patrician allows you to take one influence and one goodwill. You just take one of each of these and put them on your player board. These come from the general pool. So now we're going to go through all 10 of these buildings in order, and I'll give you a brief explanation of what they do. Capitol Hall is the first building on our list, and you've got a little symbol up here. All of the buildings will feature symbols up here, which will give you some indication about what the building does. This arrow here with that little symbol actually means that this building allows you to claim allegiance on neutral cards. The advancement for this area Advisor to the Chancellor actually features actions here. All advancements feature actions on one side of their card. There's a name along the top and art in the middle. There's also this little threat icon down here, but we'll talk about that later. This little symbol here, you'll see, refers to the agents. Now, you can't do anything with an untrained agent, so whenever you see this arrow, it means it's referring to a trained agent. And what this arrow means is that you can take two trained agents from the trained agent space on your player board, which is here, and move them onto the building in the city. Note that the arrow and the agent action always refers to the building matching the advancement that you played. So if you take this action, you'll take two of your agents and put them onto Capitol Hall. 
That's all that this action will do. But you'll notice down here this text on the bottom of City Hall. And this says, on your turn, you may return. So you see the up arrow as opposed to the down arrow. That means that you collect agents from the city building and return them to your player board to the trained agent area. So in this case, we pick up our two agents and we pay five coins. And this allows us to place an allegiance banner in a on a card in our hand. Obviously, we've not yet begun playing the game, so we have no cards in our hand. But this is how you're going to be able to claim allegiance on these cards, which you're going to want to do because it's a victory condition for the game and one of the primary scoring mechanisms. What's important to remember is that whenever you see a symbol like this that says place agents, or if you look at this Miller Mill Hollow landowner card, which we'll look at later, has both a place agents and return agents action on it, and you must choose one, it always refers to the building associated with that advancement. So you couldn't use the Mill Hollow landowner to return agents from the Capitol Hall. The next building we'll look at is the War Council. And you can see here the War Council has this exciting sword icon, and that means it's associated with hunting the monsters. The monsters are these three creatures that live in our threat tower. If we don't kill the monsters, they will eventually come and kill us. More on that later. In order to kill the monsters before they can get us, we need to hunt them. So down here we have the on your turn, you may return two trained agents to initiate a hunt. In order to get agents onto the War Council, we'll need the War Council member advancements, which are the cards present on this building. And you can see here that when we take this action, we're allowed to put one trained agent onto the War Council, or we can pay two influence to put down two trained agents which would then immediately allow us to trigger a hunt if we wanted. We're going to have helpful people like this citizen, which is one of the basic neutral starting cards, in our hand. They have these battle symbols on them. This is a battle skill, and what we want is this symbol. In fact, we need it if we're going to go hunting at all. Without this symbol, our hunt would be pointless. When you go hunting, you're looking to kill these monsters here. And you can see that some are easier than others. This is the threat value that we need to beat, and this is the reward if we kill the monster. In this case, one reputation and two reputation. In order to beat the monsters, we must have actions available in our hand with battle skills equal to or greater than the threat of the monster. Later on, we might find mega monsters like this Archfiend, Shade Knight, and Chimera combo. In this instance, we just total up the total threat of the entire card, which in this case is six, which we must equal or beat. And if we do, we can get the entire reward, which is five reputation or four reputation, and we can place a trained agent on a card in the city. And this is all or nothing. So you either have the six you need to win or you can't do it. When you do go hunting, if you just so happen to have a lot of battle points, you can kill as many of these creatures as you're able to kill. And you can choose the one you want, you don't have to go in any specific order. So if you happen to have five battle skill, you could kill both of these, claiming both rewards. When the monsters are killed, you replenish them from the bottom of the draw deck. But more on that later. And so now you understand how to initiate hunts and fight monsters. The Guildmark University is an important building. And as you can see here, it's got this little symbol up here, which means it allows us to take our untrained agents and turn them into trained agents. This down here refers to the university professor, which just so happens to be the advancement for this area. So we can see here that the university professor allows us to put a trained agent down onto this building and or, so both, pay four gold to train a new agent. So this is the train an agent symbol down here, which means we can take one of these guys and flip it up. And this little star here means this refers to the text on the building, which says, when we're resolving the professor, we pay one coin less for every agent we have at the university. So in this case, we could place an agent like we have and then pay three coins to train a new one. Note that because there's no return function on the professor, the only way to get these agents back is through the generic return action, which I'll talk about later. 
Next up, we've got Deep Hollow Border Town, right on the Blight. And this has got no ability on it, and it's got swords up here, which just means it's a straight-up fighting building. And these come with the Deep Hollow Militia Chiefs. You can see from the ability that when we take this action, we can put down up to three agents on the border town. Then, if we take the action again, we can collect two agents for three battle strength. So this is just a way to add battle strength if we want to go hunting during our turn. The treasury is an economy building, which you can tell from this little symbol here. It doesn't have an ability on it, and it just adds city treasuries. When we play these, we get three coins. You should start recognizing these symbols now. Here's the forge. It has no ability, and it's got the economy symbol and the battle strength symbol. That's because the forge is the home to the blacksmith, and the blacksmith can give you money or battle strength. Next up, we've got the Mill Hollow Farm Town, and this one's a bit special, which you can tell because it's got these ellipses. So it's an economy building just like before, but these ellipses mean it's got some special and unusual ability that doesn't fall into the other categories. And here we've got add one to your base hand size for every two trained agents you have here. Well, that won't make any sense to you right now, but don't worry, I'll explain later. We've also got the Mill Hollow Landowners, and they allow you to place agents and pick up agents in order to accrue money. Here's a new symbol. This is the defensive symbol, and what that means is that this is going to help you defend against creatures attacking you. Note that this is distinct from the hunt, and we'll talk more about blight attacks later on. But this says threats attacking you get minus one damage for each trained agent you have here. And the City Watch is the home to the City Watch commander. He allows you to place up to two trained agents on the city watch, which will help you reduce that damage from threats. Once again, because there's no way to return them on this card, the only way to get these back is with the generic return agent action. The watchtower is another defensive building, and it says when threat attacks you, you may return one agent or more, and for each agent that you return, the threat is minus three damage. And in order to get those agents onto that board, we'll have to use the Watchtower Lookout, who allows us to put down one agent. Finally, we've got the Grand Library, which is another special building. It's got no ability on the building itself, but it does offer the Grand Librarian, who can be paid money, which he'll convert into reputation. So there you have it, a rundown of all of the buildings and the iconography available in the starter scenario for Edge of Darkness. So now that we're familiar with all the buildings, we're ready to go into the prologue. In the prologue, the players are going to take turns adding advancements to their cards, and then we'll add some advancements to the neutral deck as well. The first player, which is the feed cartel over here, will be looking at the board and trying to come up with a strategy. Now they've decided that they want to take the treasury officer. So they can go into this pile, and they can select to have either the middle or bottom slot. Whenever you slot an advancement, you can always choose any advancement that is available. Our feed cartel player has decided to slot a treasury officer into one of their citizens. When you slot an advancement during the prologue, you can immediately take the action on the card provided it's applicable. So for example, in this case, the three coins is applicable. So our feed cartel will take the three coins and add them to their player board. The card with the slot, the guild card with the slot, is put into the discard pile Next in player order is the Shadow Carnival, who decides to take a blacksmith. Now, the blacksmith offers two coins or one battle strength, but battle strength at this time cannot be used because it's the prologue and we cannot activate a hunt, which means that just the Shadow Carnival will have to take the two coins and put this in the discard pile. When they take their blacksmith, they just put one of their player markers down to show that they've done that. Then it's over to the Gilded Leaf, who will do the same. Once each player has chosen one advancement, then we'll do the same again in reverse turn order. So in fact, the Gilded Leaf will choose two in a row, and then we'll go back to the Shadow Carnival, and finally, the Feed Cartel, who will have the first and last choice. Now, that's how it works in a three and a four player game, going round and then back in reverse turn order. In a two player game, it works slightly differently. Let's imagine for a minute that the Gilded Leaf is not here. Then the Feed Cartel in first slot would still have first choice, but then it would be over to the Shadow Carnival who would pick two advancements. Then we'd go back to the Feed Cartel, 
who would also pick two advancements so they'd have a total of three. Then back to the Shadow Carnival who'd pick one more, bringing their total up to three as well. So in a two-player game only, the players get three advancements during the prologue instead of two. But we are playing a three-player game, and so we might wind up with a scenario which looks like this. So as you can see now, each player has picked two advancements, and in some cases, they've also put out agents onto the cards where the cards allowed them to do that. So each player now has two remaining guild cards with no advancements. So they'll pick one of those to put onto their guild hall, and the other will go into the discard pile. The guild hall is this space on your player board. The last thing we're going to do is check the advancements that don't have player tokens on them. In this case, it's the Watchtowers, the City Watch, the Deep Hollow Border Town, and the Capital Hall. And we're going to randomly place each of those into a randomly chosen card from the neutral deck. So I'm just going to do this under the table so I can't see what I'm doing because the cards are transparent and it's easy to see otherwise. Once that's done, I'll just add these to the discard pile. And if you haven't guessed what's going on, once I've done this, I'm going to shuffle all of these into the communal deck. And then we're ready to begin the game with round one. So we give this a good shuffle. Again, we do that under the table. And now our communal deck for the City of Aegis is built. It's made out of our player guild cards, and it's made out of some of the advancements that we're playing the game with. We're going to put the deck down here into the top slot of the street, which is this track along the middle of the board. Then we're going to fill up the street with the top cards of the deck. Finally, each player will collect their player markers that they put out during the prologue, but leave their agents in place. And we're ready to move into round one. So a round takes place in two main phases. The assembly phase, which is where we draft cards from this track in the middle called the street, and the action phase, where we take actions based on the cards that we've drafted. The very first thing that happens during a player's assembly phase is that any cards in their guild hall are placed into their hand. It is possible for you to have any number of cards in your guild hall, and I'll explain how they get there over the course of this rules explanation. Once a player has put out the cards in their guild hall, it's recommended that they take the threat cubes from their threat area on their player board and put them onto the cards that have come out of the guild hall. Note that if there are no cards present because you didn't have any in your guild hall, then you should still take the threat cubes out of your threat zone and put them where you would typically have put the cards from your guild hall. Now, the deal is that in this game, all cards are face up. There is no hidden cards. So your hand refers to the cards available for you to play with, but it doesn't refer to hidden information kept secret from other players. So once you've done that, you check the number of cards you have in your hand. If it is fewer than three, you're going to draft some cards from the street. If it is three or more, then your assembly turn is done. Once a player has finished their assembly phase, it goes on to the next player in turn order. Because we've only got one card in the feed cartel, we will of course go over to the street now and start drafting. So the feed cartel will be able to draft two cards, which will take them up to three. So they're going to pick two cards out of the six available here on the street. So you will note that the top card of a on this deck is available to draft. For every card that you skip, you'll have to put down an influence. But you'll only have to do this once. So if the feed cartel decides they want to take the second and third card, they only need to put one influence on the first card in the street. These cards will be taken and added to the feed cartel's hand over here. Then. Any remaining cards here will slide to the right and will repopulate from the top of the deck. Then it is the next player's turn in turn order. Let's say it's the Shadow Carnival's turn next. And they decide that they're going to take the front first card here. Any influence gained is turned into goodwill. So when the Shadow Carnival take this card into their hand, they'll gain this influence, but it becomes goodwill. So you flip it over to the gold side 
and you put it down here in the reputation position on your player board. This is going to be worth points at the end, but it cannot be used as influence during the course of the game, which means it can't help you draft cards or pay other costs that require influence. Once each player has had a turn drafting cards, then we're ready to move into the action phase, which is the second part of the round. Again, this will take place in turn order, starting with the first player. And the very first thing that that player does on their turn is take any threat cubes in their hand and place them into the tower. Then, if this triggers a blight attack, those are resolved. However, in this instance it hasn't, so we'll talk about resolving blight attacks later. Once you've put the threat cubes in the tower and resolved any of the blight attacks, then it's time to draw more threat cubes. When checking to see how many threat cubes you draw, you check your cards for this little threat icon here. In this case we've got one on the Watchtower Lookout, and one on the Citizen, which means that our Feed Cartel is going to draw two threat tokens. So we go into the edge of the Darkness Bag, we draw two threat tokens, and put them here in the threat zone on our player board, and then they'll come out into the tower next turn. So in this way, we have some way of predicting what's going to happen in the future and preparing by killing monsters that threaten us. What happens next is that the Feed Cartel has the option to play out the actions on their cards. Furthermore, it's also mandatory that they slot an advancement into one of the cards in their hand. What this means is that they pick an advancement from any of the ten buildings and put it into any of the three cards. You can have more than three cards in your hand if you add more cards in your guild hole, or you've got the Mill Hollow Farmtown special ability, but three is standard. So, there are other buildings as well, more complex buildings, that allow you to draw extra cards too, but we're not going to get into all of that here. Suffice to say that you pretty much always want to do this as the first thing in your action phase. There's almost no reason to wait unless there's a very specific strategic influence somewhere in one of the buildings on the board. In this particular game, Based on the cards we're using and the buildings we're using, there is no reason not to do this first. So in this case, our Feed Cartel have decided they want to get another trained agent out onto the Guildmark University to enable them to get more cheaper trained agents. So, we can go into the deck of advancements here and decide whether we want a bottom or middle slot. Now, there is, of course, a tactical element to this, based on whether we want to finish this card or fill out this card. We probably want to put it into our own guild card, because it's always advantageous having advancements in your own cards. Obviously, you get the points at the end of the game, but furthermore, if other players have your cards, then they have to pay you a fee. So now that we've done our mandatory advancement, we then get to take these actions on our cards available to us, and we can take them in any order that we want. So we covered all of these actions and what they do at the building explanation earlier in the video, but what we'll do is we'll take our little player markers here, and they've all got little numbers, so the first action we're going to take, for example, is this patrician action, and then we might as well grab the second patrician action while we're at it. So we're going to go ahead and take the resources associated with those actions and put them on our player board. You can take actions on any cards in any order that you want. Unfortunately, this battle is useless to us, but we might have another use for this card in a minute. For our third action, we'll take the Lookout, which allows us to send a trained agent to the Watchtower, which will help us if one of these threats attacks us later. Then for our fourth action, we'll use the University Professor. We'll send this trained agent over to the University in order to get a discount on the agent we're about to hire. Now that we've got two trained agents on the Guildmark University, we can hire a new trained agent for two coins. So we pay the two coins back to the bank, we take a trained agent, and then we flip it face up onto our trained agent board. Now if you ever have cards in your hand and you don't want to take any actions on them, maybe because they can't be used to any good effect, or because the card belongs to another player and you don't want to, and you don't want to pay them a fee, then you can always discard one card back to the discard pile in order to return an agent from anywhere on the board to your player board. In some buildings, this is the only way to return agents 
if they don't have a function for that on the advancements that come with the building. But in this case, our feed cartel returns the citizen to the discard pile in order to recover one of their trained agents from the Guildmark University. Now that they've taken all of the actions available to them, they're going to return all their markers to their pool, and we're going to discard these two cards. Now it should be noted that this is a neutral card, and this is a feed cartel card, which means that both of them go into the discard pile. If a player ever discards a card with an allegiance that's not to their own guild, then that card goes to the guild hall of the player who owns that card. Whenever a card your guild owns is discarded by anyone or anything but you, it goes to your guild hall. The only time your cards that you own go to the discard pile is when you're finished playing them on your action phase. In this example, the feed cartel has two cards that they can't play or don't want to play. They can discard both of these to the, commu to the discard pile, and then they can take one action on any card in the street. Note that when you take one action on any card in the street, you still have to pay the fee. So if they want an action off of this card, they're still going to have to pay one coin to the Gilded Leaf. Whenever you take an action on a card that belongs to another guild, you must pay that guild one coin for every action on their card that you took. So if you take two actions, you have to pay two coins. If you don't have the money, then you can't take the action. It doesn't matter if the action you're taking would give you the money to then pay for it. You must pay for it first. There are some more complex scenarios where you might take an action on a card in the street in this way, and then in the same turn, somehow get that card into your hand. If you do, you cannot take that action again, which is why you should put your player marker down on it. So the Feed Cartel had finished playing all their cards this round, which means play carries on to the next player in turn order. They will start by doing the same thing, which is putting their threat cubes into the threat tower from their hand. Then they'll check for blight attacks, and then they'll draw new threat cubes to their threat zone. Still no attacks. Then they'll play out all of their actions, and so on and so forth, until each player has had a turn to do that. The last thing that happens is that the first player token moves on to the next player in turn order. They'll be the first player next round. Then we move on the round marker, and we begin again. Just note that if you ever run out of cards in the street, which means actually any time there are six cards available, and there's no deck under the sixth card, then you shuffle the discard pile to make a new deck. And players can choose to do this the minute the deck runs out or wait until the end of their turn to do it. There might be some strategic reason for this. It really depends on which city tiles you're playing with. In this game, there's no reason to wait to do this. And then you just return the shuffle deck to the bottom of the sixth card in the street. So let's talk about blight attacks. As we chuck cubes into the Blight Tower, these spaces will be filling up with cubes. When enough cubes get into a single space, this triggers a Blight Attack. In a two-player game, it's six or more cubes. In a three-player game like this one, it's seven or more cubes. And in a four-player game, it's eight or more cubes. So we've just triggered a Blight Attack in this zone here. Now we're gonna check the cubes in the zone. We've got three reds two blacks and a green, which means that in this case the Arch Fiend is going to attack the red player. If green had been tied with red, then both green and red would be attacked. If black is ever in the lead or tied for most, then all players are attacked. So in this case, all the players would be attacked, and in this example as well, all the players would be attacked. Whenever a threat card attacks, you take all of the cubes that were in the pit and set them to a discard pile. Whenever the bag is empty, that discard pile will be returned to the bag, but the bag is not reset until such time as you go to draw cubes and there are none left. When a monster attacks, it attacks with its threat value. The threat value is applied to everyone who's attacked. So in this case, everyone is attacked, so everyone is attacked with three damage. It's not split. 
the players must find some way to defend against this damage. Unfortunately, our short-sighted Shadow Carnival and Gilded Leaf did not put any trained agents into defense. Therefore, they're both going to take one damage from the Arch Fiend. Whenever you're hit by a card, you always take one damage. However, our Feed Cartel here was more prepared and they put a trained agent down on the watchtower. And when a threat attacks, they can recall this trained agent to reduce the threat by three. Because they've reduced the threat to zero, they are safe. Whenever you successfully defend against a blight attack, you gain one reputation. Note that you do not gain the reward on the card. That's for only if you defeat it in a hunt. See our building explanation earlier in the video for how that works. But if you do fend off a blight attack, have one reputation point. Unfortunately, our Shadow Cartel were unable to fend off the attack, so their defense track here on the side of the board goes down by one step. Note that it doesn't matter how much damage they took. They might have taken two damage or seven, but if they were unable to defend, for every card they could not defend against, they move down one step. Finally, once the attack is resolved, all of the cubes are moved to the discard pile, and the card itself is flipped back over to its civilian side and put in the general discard pile. Then, the player whose turn it is can decide if they want to draw a new monster now, or wait until the end of their turn to draw a monster. Monsters are drawn from the bottom of this deck here. Note that if there is no deck, because we're down to the top card in the street, then you'll have to make a new deck in order to draw a monster. You can never put a card in the street, including this one, into the threat pool. So, you just draw the bottom card from the deck, and flip it over, and there's the new monster. If multiple monsters are triggered, they always attack left to right, and it should be noted that even though this monster has two parts to it, it's a dark agent and a fallen wizard, it attacks with four, and if you defend against it, then you still just get the one reputation. If it defeats you, then you still only lose one spot on your defense track. Note that when this monster is resolved, either because it attacked as part of a blight attack, or it was defeated in the hunt, because it has a Shadow Carnival allegiance, it's flipped over to its good side and placed in the Shadow Carnival guild hall. So now what we're gonna do is we're just gonna look at a quick example of end game scoring. When you get to the end of the eighth round, the game is over. We're gonna tally up victory points to determine the winner. It should be noted that there is a special bonus that happens at the very beginning of the end game scoring, before anything else is done. Players are going to look at any of their guild cards in their guild hall, and any of their guild cards on the street. For every slot that's filled on these cards, they're going to gain one goodwill point. So in this case, our feed cartel is going to get two from this card here. Our Carnival of Shadows will get three from this card here and this card here. And our Gilded Leaf will get a whopping six from this card here and these three here. Remember that Goodwill is this one here, the back of the influence. Once you've awarded all the Goodwill correctly, then you can proceed with regular endgame scoring. Now, it doesn't matter how many players you have, this is done the same. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put out two player boards and just walk you through a quick example. So here we've got some end game player boards. We've also got all of their elite allied cards for both sides. Now if we check our score pad here, first off, whoever has the most reputation tokens is going to earn two points. And in the case of a tie, each player will get one. So in this case, our Feed Cartel player has 16 to the 14 owned by our Shadow Carnival. So, two points to the purple side. Next, it's Most Trained Agents. And note that this counts for all of them. You collect your trained agents at the end of the game. So that's clearly the Shadow Carnival with six to the Feed Cartel's five. Two points to Shadow Carnival. Then it is the Most Guild Cards. So that is Claimed Cards with your guild allegiance. So, Feed Cartel has six, and the Shadow Carnival has seven. So, two points to the Shadow Carnival. Finally, its highest score on the defense track, which is the Feed Cartel. Two points to them. So, it's still neck and neck. Then, it's one point for each of the trained 
agents, six and five. It's one VP for each of your reputation, 14 and 16. Then it's slots filled on our guild cards. So you count all of the slots on the guild cards. So in this case, it's two, three, five, six, eight, 11, 12. And for our feed cartel, it's one, three, five, seven, nine, and 12 as well. Our position on the defense track, which is 16 points for the feed cartel and 12 points for the shadow carnival. Finally, you total up any goodwill tokens, money, and influence you have, then divide it by four and add that many VPs. And note that you can have quarter sections. So over here, we've got 21 goodwill. We've got nine coins for a total of 30, 32, which is a total of eight points. Over here, we've got five, 10, 17, 21, 22, 23, which gives us five points and three quarters, which gives our Shadow Carnival player a grand total of 56, which I think I've worked out correctly, and our Feed Cartel player a grand total of 58 and three quarters, making them our winner by two and three quarters points. Congratulations, Feed Cartel player. Note that it is possible to win by just one quarter of a point, but in the event of the tie, the first tiebreaker is your guild cards, the number of, not your total score. And then it's your number of trained agents. And finally, your number of total influence and coins. If you're still tied after that, then you rule the city together in complete and total harmony. So that's it for Edge of Darkness. I hope this video has given you the information you need to get started playing with your friends at home. But if you fancy seeing the game in action and coming with us on a... Aegis Edge of Darkness adventure. I'll be joined by Chris Britton tomorrow as we play through this starter scenario to see who can take control of Aegis and fend off the blight at the Edge of Darkness. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you tomorrow.